Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single episode and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Hello and welcome to Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm J.P. Clark, an associate professor teaching in the Basic Strategic Art Program and the Editor-in-Chief for War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Our regular listeners will know that over the last several months, we've had a couple of podcasts that touch on the topic of strengthening the profession, one of the top four priorities for the Army's Chief of Staff, General Randy George. One major component of that is invigorating professional writing and discourse, with uh, the flagship of that effort probably being the Harding Project, which is an effort to revitalize the branch journals. Today, I'm fortunate to be joined by two accomplished military authors who not only, uh, who not coincidentally are some of the leading figures behind the Harding Project for the special edition of our On Writing series. Lieutenant Colonel Zachary Griffiths is the Harding Project lead within the Office of the Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, Prior to that, he has done a little of everything, a Special Forces officer with deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Zach has also taught in the Social Sciences Department at West Point and served as a White House Fellow at the National Security Council. He has published over 30 written pieces of various types and genres, uh, something that I think we'll get into in a little bit, uh, and that does not even include all of the Substack posts from the Harding Project. Captain Theo Lipsky is currently attending graduate school at Columbia University on his way to an assignment in the Social Sciences Department at West Point, uh, which I guess is evidently where all the cool kids are hanging out these days. Uh, But uh, uh, Theo is an armor officer and one who has stayed on the cavalry side of the house with assignments to airborne and striker units in Germany and Washington State. And he has published eight articles on various topics. And so, Zach, Theo, welcome to the War Room. Thanks, JP. Glad to be here. Thank you, JP. All right. So, uh, Zach, before we get into the on-writing portion, and we want to talk about your, your all's experiences as writers, it's probably a good idea to do a brief overview of the Harding Project because some, some of our, I'm sure some of our listeners are aware, but others aren't. So what exactly is it and, and what are its objectives? Yeah, JP, thanks for having me in here today um, to talk about this. It's been a privilege to be at the War College these last couple of days. We see professional writing is just really important to the Army, um, but an area that needs to be renewed. You know, there's a way you can share ideas by writing, as um, Theo and I have, and you, of course, have as well. Um, General George often talks about this article from the 90s called Training Management Tips that inspired him to you know, better train his company. So you get a big impact that way. And then sometimes we also see writing lead to policy change. There's a War Room article uh, recently or a few years ago that talked about the DA photo, and then we saw that taken off for the board. So there's not exactly causal, but like this writing is important and can get attention to senior leaders, whether it's you're contributing just a little bit to an overall change or just contributing to the discourse about the future of the army. So we think it's important. Yeah. Well, and then you're being modest in that, uh, you know, the Harding project began with an article that you wrote, uh, you know, low, low crawling our way to obscurity. Is that right? Yeah. So it's, there's two. The first was at the Modern War Institute. We wrote bringing back branch magazines and then low crawling to obscurity at military review were kind of the two key pieces that, that led into that. So it's, it was a great to be able to use that infrastructure to help, um, identify this as an area for the Army and then work to renew it. Um, so we're working on four big areas. Uh, the first is on modernization, um, right? We're trying to move all the branch journals to a web-first, mobile-friendly format, very similar to the War Room, where readers can come, you can reach the scrolling soldier on their phone when they're at the shopette or wherever, right? The idea is that we can tackle into these small pieces of time. We're not printing these anymore, and so being able to reach soldiers where they are is really important. The second piece that's important is trying to make the archives accessible. So there's about 6,000 issues that go back to 1888 of the Army's branch magazines. And we're going to make all those searchable through a partnership with the Defense Technical Information Center at the article level. So we'll be able to find those great insights from the past. The third part we're working on is what I call staffing and stewardship. And so this is right now, all the Army's branch journals are kind of alone and unafraid at each of the centers of excellence. And so we're going to empower Army University Press at Fort Leavenworth to kind of act as the the parent, you know, that helps supervise and make sure they are going on a good path. Well, the center still retain editorial independence. We're also going to invest in the staffing 
um, so that each outlet has one uniform, probably a senior captain, though it could be other folks, and then two civilians as a team that will guide these journals into the future. The fourth area is education. And so this is trying to make sure that all of our PME, our professional military education courses, involve the journals in some way uh, so that everyone knows the name of their branch magazine. They know they exist and they know why it's important they contribute and how they strengthen the profession. Uh, finally, we also do outreach. And so I'm at the War College this week because we're doing a special issue of Military Review this summer focused on providing tools on how people get started. So I hope this conversation builds on, on that project or helps folks think about why they may want to write. Uh, but you should look for a special issue coming out online and then in print later this summer. So that's the Harding Project and what we're trying to do. Now, thank you for that overview. And, you know, it, you know, a lot of people don't think about the plumbing. And right now we're going to talk about, hey, let's, you know, we want people to write and that's where we're going to be the focus on. But I know that definitely, uh, I actually, I texted a historian friend yesterday as they were talking about moving all of the, you know, the historical journals over to, uh, you know, the, uh, the Fort Leavenworth website. And uh, he was like, oh my God, that's going to be amazing when I can do a search and find something from 1920. But I know that probably, in, and we may get into the, a little bit of this and how many of the problems we're facing today, you know, probably a, a lot of searches for 1980s and 1990s and, you know, infantry, armor, you know, all of those sorts of journals probably gives us some pretty good insights into where we're going. But uh, so, Theo, how, how did you get involved in the Harding Project? Colonel Griffiths and I had been talking about professional writing and how it might contribute to the stewardship of the Army profession overall for a bit. I'd written a piece that he looked at that discussed the migration of the intra-professional dialogue from long form writing to social media and how that might come at a cost and we ought check it or at least advocate for long form writing amidst that transition the best we could. And then when he wrote the piece for Modern War Institute arguing that we bring back branch journals, we realized that we were kindred spirits in that we both saw this as a cause worth fighting for. So when he asked if I would be willing to be involved in the Harding Project, uh, to me it was an easy yes. And since then, I would say I've played a very junior role and Colonel Griffiths and Sergeant First Class Leighton Summerlin have done the heavy lifting, uh, but it's been a thrill to be involved. Okay. Well, thank And actually, uh, we'll, we'll put one more question out there before we get into you guys as authors. I think that's an important point in terms of for the, somebody who says, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm putting out things on X or, you know, maybe a Reddit or, you know, whatever it might be. I have this other format. Uh, why, why should they care about putting it into a branch journal? You know, you know Theo, what, what was your argument in the article? The argument had several components. The first component is that the design of social media platforms is such that they don't induce quality thought. That, I think, sometimes appears to people as a Luddite take, and I own that it might appear that way. But I think that the more one begins to understand user interface design, of social media platforms, the easier it is to argue that they don't induce quality thought. They're meant to retain user attention and there's certain emotions that best sustain user attention and they're not the emotions that one associates with meaningful dialogue. They're anger and they're shock and they are betrayal. And so it perverts dialogue. Of course, I think there are tons of good uses to social media. I use social media all the time. I've learned a lot from social media. I've encountered ideas on social media. I've met wonderful people on social media. Before Colonel Griffiths and I ever met, we exchanged messages about how great long form writing is on social media platforms. So how meta there, right? Yeah. <laughs> one, one need not uh, press the point too hard, but I think that it has very strict limits to how well it can steward thought. And if one were to 
primarily host an intra-professional dialogue on social media, they would be disappointed by the outcome. So that's the first argument. The second argument is that w- the content on social media is not enduring in the way that long form writing is enduring. And the reason that matters, and I almost feel silly explaining this to you as a historian, because I have much more to learn from you than you from me on this head, but sometimes we don't live to see our ideas take hold or bear fruit or deliver returns, whichever metaphor you'd like. Sometimes we move on to another problem. Sometimes we move on to another profession. Sometimes we move on to a different stage in life. Sometimes we die before these ideas take hold. But in order for them to take hold, they need to be contained in an enduring vessel. And that the technology can do as of yet, an X post is not enduring. A Reddit post is not as enduring. A Facebook post is not as enduring. That's for reasons relating to privacy settings. That's for reasons relating to search engine optimization. That's for cultural reasons within uh, historical practice. And so you have a better chance of your idea eventually coming into contact with a fellow traveler who has the power to do something about it if you write it in long form for a publication like War Room or for the Modern War Institute or for Army Times or for War on the Rocks, what have you. A third reason is that long form writing encourages the full development of an idea and it's harder for that reason, which is a a reason why people don't undertake the effort. But the idea that you have might require a good deal of work before it deserves people's attention and can reach its potential. And the posting mechanisms on social media are so easy that they induce us, setting aside any of the incentives that I discussed earlier and the emotions associated with them, to launch ideas into the universe half-baked. And That's a disservice to us, it's a disservice to the idea, and it's a disservice to the people whom the idea might help. Uh, So it's not always sexy, but the work of developing that idea from a great tweet to a great article is a process, I think, worth doing. And I I wanna bookend this comment by saying, I realize this makes me sound like a 30-year-old grandpa. I embrace that identity, I don't apologize for it, but I am aware of it. Yeah, and then Zach, please go ahead. Yeah, you know, to Theo's point about kind of building on that history over time, like we, Harding is, you know, was a major general in World War II, and I very much draw on his legacy as the editor for Infantry Journal and of mailing list in the 1930s, um, because he did enter into the record. What he shows us an example uh, in, in the record, in his writings, of how he renewed Infantry Journal and mailing list in the 1930s. And so, right, like, He did that work then that then, because it's in the record, can inspire us today. Uh, And so, like, you know, as I was thinking about this project, I was very much trying to understand the history of all these journals and why they had them. And so Harding was a really great figure there that we channel his legacy. And if he hadn't written it down, like, it would be gone. Yeah. So, you know, to that, the one of the personal examples that I I draw upon, you know, I must have been a second lieutenant in the late 90s reading an armor magazine and a article by entry major Robert Bateman and he was talking about digital shock and so he was imagining in the very early days I don't think we're even to blue force tracker this is like you know the early force 21 days and he's like what is that going to do to the psychology as we have all of these new connections that has always stuck with me and the fact that one I can go back and I can tell people hey here's a you know I can actually give it to them rather than just having to recount what was in the article Uh, But then also, you know, if it had been today, would I have been following him on X? Would I have been following him on wherever? Probably not. And so that serendipity of having just a a larger group that you're talking to is 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 pretty important. But let's let's get into you guys as 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 writers. So, Theo, I want to start with you because you are on your way to you know, or you're in graduate school right now. You're on your way to be an instructor, but. All these articles you've written up to this time, this is actually when you are a company officer serving in MTO units. So 
one of the things that I often hear uh, from folks is that they just don't see themselves in somebody as, you know, I, I'm not a writer. I, I'm not one of those people who publish. They think there's some like magical degree or certificate that you get at some point and that makes you. So how did you get into writing when you were out there in the force? Sure. So the first thing that happened that alerted me to the potential to write professionally while you were on the line was my troop commander added me as a co-author on a paper concerning the use of electronic warfare assets integrated with the cavalry. They were lessons that he and the MICO commander in the brigade in which I served had observed while participating in a joint warfighter assessment exercise at Hohenfels. And he asked that I take a look at the draft. I provided some edits. I think I provided some language. And though he did not need to, he added me as a co-author. I didn't even know that he was going to. And then it ran in Ar Armor Magazine. And he emailed me the PDF and said, congratulations, you're an author. And I realized it was that simple. And I want to flag that up front because I think that it also illustrates that you can get other people to write uh, very easily. Not only can you write easily, and sometimes it takes a raider or a mentor opening that door for an author for them to start writing. And I want to give credit where credit is due. That was Captain Donnie Wong. After that, I realized that I felt better about a problem that I'd encountered and thought through if I put it to pen and tried to understand it more deeply. I used to, as an executive officer at the company or troop level, go to breakfast every morning with all the other executive officers. And we would sit down, drink probably four cups of coffee each between 8.15 a.m. in our PTs and 9.15 a.m. and gripe about everything that was wrong with our unit, everything that was wrong with the army, everything that was wrong with the universe. And also, though we didn't even realize it half the time, shared notes about how to overcome the problems about which we were griping. And I think about a year and a half into my combined two years as a troop executive officer, I did time as a line troop executive officer, then I was the headquarters troop executive officer, I realized some of the conversations we'd been having every day for a year and a half. And I thought it feels good in the moment to complain about these things. But if I am as good as I think I am, I should be able to articulate in a more enduring fashion what the problem is and how one might go about solving it. And then COVID hit and I had to stay in my apartment in Germany for 14 days. And I thought if I can't do this now, then I can't do it because fate and a pandemic have handed me 14 days of white space. I previously used the excuse that I don't have white space to avoid writing this. And so I, I wrote my first piece and it was about the pitfalls of unit status reports, how we measure readiness, the perverse maintenance practices that that induces and ways that we might fix that told from the perspective of a line company executive officer who'd spent two years in a motor pool where there's a lot of pressure to be ready for war because we were Oconus in Europe and how that sometimes counterintuitively made us less ready for war. And I published that piece and immediately got a lot of emails. The venue was military review from officers and maintenance chiefs that said, good job, good going. If it makes you feel better or if it doesn't make you feel better, this was true in 1988 too when I was an XO at Bombholder. Or I liked your analysis. You got some things wrong about unit status reports. Or I'm a future battalion commander. I never thought about that dynamic that way. I'm going to be thinking about that on the line. Or I just got out of my time as a battalion XO, and I want to tell you, you're not imagining it. That dynamic's true. Here's some things we managed to do at the battalion level 
to mitigate the harms that you were observing. Just something to put in your back pocket. Thank you for writing very respectfully, so and so. And that put a charge in me. I thought that was more profound than the experience I had at the breakfast table. They're not mutually exclusive. And I will never give up the happy memory of those many mornings I had with the best officers I've ever met at that breakfast table. But I realized that the idea, had it stayed at the breakfast table, would not have made me better in the way the writing process made me better, had not made me a wiser officer in the way that the feedback and the writing process had made me a wiser officer. And so I wanted to do it again. But right now, this morning, as we record this podcast, all over the Army's major and minor installations, there are staff sergeants and there are lieutenants having the exact same conversations that became that article. And the hope is that with the work of Lieutenant Colonel Griffiths and the Chief's Office and Sergeant Summerlin, more of those ideas will become pieces in the future. Yeah, well, that's an it's a really nice you know it's it's the uh, the the old version of social media and the exact same thing we talked about. It's not that those conversations are bad, but you know, getting them right. down into a different format right. makes them something that can go around. And, and thank you for drawing that parallel. Social media and long form writing are not mutually exclusive, and in fact, they're mutually reinforcing at their best. And I don't think that you can ever just turn off the former and strictly. Ad- undertake the latter. And I, I know Colonel Griffiths agrees. The question is just, do we have the combination right in the present in our profession? And I think the thesis of this conversation and perhaps the Harding Project is that we could do with more long-form professional writing, particularly from our junior leaders who are close to the problems on the ground and have good ideas that demand a hearing. Yeah, very good. All right, Zach, so what's what's your origin story? You know, I did not benefit from having a leader like Theo that could show me the way. Um, I felt inclined, especially when I finished my time as a special forces team leader. Uh, but I didn't really know how to get started. I was kind of intimidated. So for me, it took graduate school to kind of get into it. Um, I, I took a class on political writing. But what I learned in that class was that really it could be trained uh, in a way that I hadn't previously appreciated. Like it was an eight-week class. It was very intense. By the time I left, I felt very equipped with the tools necessary to participate um, in writing. And so, uh, you know, I wrote a couple of pieces while I was in grad school and then have really stuck with it since, both on the line and while I was in teaching assignments or other places. Uh, but what I, that inspired me to do when I was a company commander was to do what I called like a unit book review program. And I wanted to make sure that all of my captains sort of had the opportunity to publish something. Uh, book reviews are a pretty easy way to get started. They do an important professional service by screening books and making you think critically about the books you're reading. And so, you know, I challenged each of my captains to pick a book, write a book review, and ultimately we got everyone wrote one. We got one published in Military Review, one published in Parameters. And so, you know, the, whether those officers can be writing, I'm not sure, but now they know the process. Um, and so I was trying to help hold their hand a little bit, such they could get going on that path if they wanted to. So, I think as Theo's commander did, you know, leaders have an important role in helping folks who have good ideas, shepherd them into writing that they need to be out there and also just showing them the way. Not everyone's going to want to do it, but some will. And you can help by giving a gentle push. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting to me how something like writing, and this goes back to uh, a piece that, that, that I had written about the origins at, uh, at Zach's behest on the origins of the professional journal that appeared in uh, Modern War Institute under the, uh, the title of uh, John Wayne and his writing desk at how writing, because it tends to be solitary, or at least, you know, the, the, the actual recording of the, uh, the thoughts, it should be perfect for distributed communities, but it struck me how often this actually has geographic clusters because it really builds off of somebody's example and you learn, oh, wait, actually, people like me can do this. Uh, and so I think that you guys have, have two great illustrations of that. But for those people who now, hopefully they're like, okay, maybe maybe I can do this. Uh, we'll, we'll go with Zach first. But uh, if, if you could describe what uh, your writing process is. So you have an idea. Hey, here's something I want to say. How do you go about it? You know, I think the biggest myth I'd dispel is like that someone just sits down and writes, you know, 2,000 words and publishes them. Um, My personal process, right, is typically I'll have an idea. Um, I'll make a Google Doc on my phone where I maybe just put down like a couple words related to that idea. And then I might not touch it for weeks um, and I'll come back to it and I'll flush it out a little bit more when 
I've ridden my bike home and I have more thoughts on it and then I'll flush it out some more. An idea I'm working through right now is the idea that we should treat small UAS as ammunition um, in the army, right? Because it, it, it's ammunition can actually be quite expensive, right? A javelin's like a hundred thousand dollars, but we treat them as expendable. The clue is durable, and so I think there may be parallels with how we treat small UAS, right? We want them to show up in the battlefield at a container that we can use. So anyway, that's the idea. And so probably like two months ago, I started a Google Doc and I kind of just like wrote small UAS as ammunition, right? And then I've come back to it periodically and flushed it out and. Uh, I have to do a lot of writing for the Harding Project right now, so this idea hasn't kind of gotten all the way done. But by iterating on it and kind of flushing out each idea over time, eventually I get to a point where I have a pretty solid draft. Um, I maybe take that to some friends. I've hijacked parties before um, to say, like, hey, this is something I'm thinking about. You know, what do you think? Uh, and then I complete the writing process and then send it off to work with an editor. But so, like, you know, I, my biggest thing is, like, this isn't necessarily something that you just sit down and write. It out, but it's an iterative process of thinking and jotting notes down over time. Yes, no, that is uh, is fantastic advice to writers. Uh, Theo, what's uh, you know, there's the the 14 weeks granted to you by a global pandemic, but you've written a few pieces since then. So, uh, how, how how do you fit something into the busy life of a company grade officer? How, how do you go after that? Well, you take time away from your wife. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so at various times, I've written pieces in my short company grade career. The first piece was while I was a lieutenant, and it was considered a task, not unlike planning a range from my troop commander. And that was my first piece in which I was listed as a co-author, a relatively light lift. He was merciful about it. And generous, I think, in granting me co-authorship. The second one was, as you said, during a 14-day mandated quarantine. But it was an idea that I'd had again and again and again over the course of a year and a half. So a lot of the thinking had already been done. And I had brought the book that gave me a theoretical framework by which to understand what was going on with the unit status reports to a field exercise preceding the quarantine. And... It was my reading, you know, when my truck was killed and we were waiting to be revived by the OCTs. That was The Tyranny of Metrics by uh, Jerry Muller, by the way. Highly recommend. And the next piece was written while I was at Triple C. And the next piece was written while I was on staff at First Corps. And then I think I wrote one or two others in command. There's never a perfect time. There's no formula. I think that I was selective about what I wanted to write about because I understood that apportioning time to the writing process came at a cost always, either to my personal life or to my professional life. And the bet that I made was that the self-improvement that I would reap from the writing process and maybe the contribution to the profession that the article would represent was worth the trade-off. But that's a decision you have to make every time. Once I did make the decision to write, I think usually I apportioned a couple hours a day over the course of a week or two to the writing process. And that typically occurred after the bulk of the day's work had been done. And in order to ensure that the idea merited that kind of time, I first confirmed to myself and sometimes with peers or mentors or bosses or subordinates that the idea was useful and also novel. Observing, for example, that a dismounted patrol through the woods benefits from dispersion might not warrant the time that I took to write it. But if you or I felt that the idea wasn't getting its due in the discourse, uh, for example, while I was at Triple C, I attended some mandatory ethics classes, and I thought, I don't think that these are achieving their intent. And I think the ethical education of company grade officers matters a lot because company grade officers are often in investigations into the ethical transgressions of tactical units, the ones who are held responsible. So we need to get this right. I didn't see other people making that observation. I didn't feel in the classroom there's the sense of urgency to get the curriculum right. I talked to other people about it. They felt the same way. 
I reached this critical mass of confidence that this was worth setting some time aside during my otherwise welcome reprieve that was triple C uh, to write. And, and that's when I wrote it. It's trickier for non-commissioned officers. I, I think this is really important for officers to flag in these conversations. We have programmatic breaks in our career that lend themselves to reflection and that lend themselves to authorship. I think that triple C highly are great times to write because you're off the line, uh, you are given time and you're given a classroom to think about what of your experience was notable and what you learned from it. I don't think that we honor non-commissioned officers with the same thing. I don't want to second guess the entire human resources approach that currently governs uh, an enlisted soldier's trajectory through the army. But I realize that the timeline that I've enjoyed and how it's overlapped on my writing is not necessarily possible for every non-commissioned officer. Yeah, well, that ties us into, you know, we've, we've made a couple references to Sergeant First Class Leighton Summerlin, and I am just in awe of his origin story of starting to write when he was a drill instructor with a newborn. Uh, that is about as hard a lift. And so uh, I, I challenge all of our listeners. I, I don't know anybody has less disposable time than, than he did at that moment. But, you know, you've both, just to kind of summarize here, a really important point of this isn't a solitary activity. Uh, in some ways now it does have uh, impacts uh, on family, loved ones, whatever. Uh, I always used to joke because we had two toddlers when I was doing a lot of my work at, at West Point when I was teaching, which is a which is a pretty good time to to do this. Although I didn't feel like I had you know tons of spare time, and you know my wife is taking the girls to go to the mall. She spent some extra time just to buy me you know an extra hour in which I write three paragraphs, two of which I then delete during a revision. But then also you've 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 pointed out the the keep on talking and you know farm it out you know you're you're hijacking parties don't know if everybody would uh, um, you know you're, you're you're cooler than I am I would not get invited back to parties if I were to do something like that but you know shopping it out to peers sub, you know superior subordinates is just such a, a integral part. And just kind of know that it, yeah, it's going to be hard, but that extended process is, is really worthwhile. Zach? Yeah. JP, I loved in your article about John Wayne at his writing desk, um, how you make this argument, right? They have these like cluster places and the schools are terrific places to do this kind of writing because they have a library and you have all your peers that have all their experience. One of the things Sergeant Summerlin and I do when we do visits to schools is just try and tell instructors like what a golden opportunity they have to write because they have experience from the field. They've got access to libraries and smart peers, and they also can draw on the experience of every student that comes through. You know, And so as an instructor, you have, I think, almost an obligation to think about something and write it down for your branch or for the Army um, while you're there. Yeah. And, and yeah, faculty have tended historically to be the ones really producing. We kind of ta naturally think that, oh, it's students who are writing papers, but it's the faculty member who, after they've taught something for the sixth time, they're like, there's just got to be a better way to do this. And the branch journals are the perfect place to do that. Yeah, you know, at their best, they should really be a flywheel, right? Where like the instructors can summarize things and write papers that are going to help the teaching. But then also the stuff from the field, if you know, we have company XOs writing on status reports, that should be coming into the schoolhouse and thought about it as well. So, you know, at their best, they're pushing information, pulling information from the field and then pushing it, you know, back out and synthesized. And so um, I think by getting some uniform folks on the staff of each of these journals at the schools, hopefully we can get that sp flywheel spinning a little bit faster in the Army. Yeah, no, I think that that should give us a good virtuous cycle. But we, uh, we are coming close to our time. So I want to give each of you a chance to say, hey, if there's a non-commissioned officer, warrant officer, you know, officer, you know, Probably, you know, company grade, somebody who, who isn't in that position like, you know, teaching at West Point where it kind of lends itself to it. What would your advice be to them? And so we'll start off with you, Theo. First is that there is not risk in writing, except in the hours that you set aside being lost to other activities. I have never been penalized for writing. And often my writing is arguing that 
a unit's policy or the army's policy is bad and it could be better and I think I know better. So it's the sort of writing that one might expect would get a slap on the wrist. At every turn, my leaders have said, I appreciate your feedback, good going, or Charlie, Mike, I have no problem with that. So I say that just because oftentimes I hear from junior leaders a concern that they are going to incur some sort of retaliation for speaking their mind on a topic in a dissenting way. There's a way to dissent irresponsibly, of course, ad hominem, deeply cynical, without a constructive recommendation. But most of our leaders in the army neither want to do that and are also capable of much more useful writing than that. So I encourage them to take the leap. And then the second thing I'd say is if you assume that somebody else is probably working on it, you're wrong. What I found is that not because the army doesn't care or the army is too calcified to adapt, but because there's so many good problems to work on, the assumption that, well, if I have this idea, someone smarter or better positioned to act on it than I also has probably had this idea, so I'm going to keep it to myself is a faulty assumption. You probably, if you feel strongly about an idea and it has been substantiated by your experience time and time again, have something worth saying that other people might not be thinking about. And the worst thing that could happen is you publish an article that is redundant, and that is good too, because it takes more than one voice to convince an institution that change is needed. And oftentimes, if only one article has been published, that is a guarantee that the idea will die. So it's a win-win. Either you contribute something novel, or you give momentum to an already existing idea that needs that momentum. And either way, the writing process will make you a better thinker and a better soldier. Yeah. And also, and as you kind of read referenced, the, you know, the tweet, there's the angry tone where you're just kind of coming off half baked. But then when you think, well, okay, you know, hey, my battalion commander is going to be reading this. Maybe a little bit of measure and reflection tends to make us a little bit better than in the uh, the heat of the moment when we're, we're frustrated with whatever system the, uh, the the army or DOD has burdened us with. So, Zach, what, what's your advice? Um, you know, one thing I want to build on Theo here is just say that the other thing we haven't touched on is how writing can help develop communities of interest. And so one benefit also is you can find like-minded peers across a million-person organization, right? And so that can help solve problems at your level or other places. We haven't touched on that. Um, in terms of getting started... Uh, I think everyone should do it. I did a survey that backs up what Captain Lipsky said last summer when there's people do not face retribution for writing across the army. Um, but I do want to ask kind of my call to action be, you know, follow our substack at hardingproject.com. We have a number of how-to guides in, uh, on the how-to tab. And so, and we're going to roll out a special issue of Military Review dedicated to this topic this summer. And so if you're feeling inspired, you want to know where to get started, you know, following our substack is a great way to stay up to date. And then we are going to continue to roll out these how-to guides over the next several months. So um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I hope people yeah. are Yeah. And, well, and my one bit coming in from the uh, editorial side for, for authors is... Figure out who you want to talk to, and probably it's people like you, and where are they going, where are they reading, because that's the the thing, that each of these venues has different audiences, and it's not bad. It's, it, it's no reflection on your worth as a human being if an editor says, hey, I'm sorry, this just isn't quite right for us. You know, we do it all the time here at War Room, but we often say, well, you know, maybe you want to consider this other publication. Uh, they, they, they might be the right fit for you because this article is a little bit too technical, a little too tactical, too long. We don't publish so long. And in order to know that, one, take a look at the articles that, in, uh, that you like and you might want to publish there. But also, every publication has a submissions guideline page, whether virtual uh, on for, for online or, you know, on, you know, actually, if, if it's a print publication, take a look at those guidelines, follow them, and, and feel free to talk to editors. We really want good content. And we like to have conversations with folks before they go too far down the road. Send a pitch, 
and then that way everybody is 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 getting by in, in the uh, the best way possible and without the uh, the least amount of frustration and miscommunication. So that would just be the one thing I would throw out there for articles or for for authors who who want to get started. But uh, we we definitely are over time now. So thank you so much, Zach and Theo. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, please send us your comments on this and all of our other programs. If you've not done so already, please subscribe to Better Peace so that you can receive all of our episodes and uh, learn more some of the uh, the fantastic content we have. And Mike Nyberg will soon be back in terms of our on-writing series. You don't have to listen to me anymore. Uh, after you do uh, subscribe, please rate and review this podcast so that even more people can join in conversations like this one. And even though this conversation is complete, we look forward to welcoming you back in the future. Until then, from the War Room, I'm J.P. Clark. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.